out loud. I thought this was a mic, but it's not. Just so <laughs> yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, it's really nice to uh, meet you. Thank you, Claire, for inviting me to give this uh, seminar. Um, so today's title of my presentation is Identifying Women and Children at High Risk of Chronic Diseases Using the Pregnancy Window. So um, I'm Black African, and my pronouns are she slash her. So today I'm going to talk briefly about my reset journey so far, some of which um, Claire has already mentioned, and my overall reset vision, uh, the past work we've done, and my current um, and future reset vision. So this slide is really busy because this is how busy my life has been. <laughs> so I am um, originally from Nigeria and West Africa, and I was born and raised in Port Harcourt, and I did my all my pre-university education in Nigeria. And then I went to uh, Ghana for my bachelor's degree, where I did a BSc in biochemistry, and then after, at the University of Ghana. And then after that, I moved to Europe, and I did my master's in public health. Do you have a question? Oh, okay. <laughs> He's a graduate I, of the oh, University of Ghana. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah, I went to the University of Ghana, they thought. And then I did my master's in public health and um, uh, specialized in health services research at the University of Sheffield in England. And then I moved to North America and I did my PhD at the University of British Columbia. And uh, my PhD was in reproductive and developmental sciences, which is in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. And then I moved from that end of the country to the other end to my postdoc in McGill in uh, the, the Department of Epidemiology. And towards the end of my postdoc, I went, I got a visiting research uh, fellowship. So I went to Norway for about three months and I did some work there at the University of Oslo. And then I moved to the US last year to start my current position. So having lived in all these <laughs> places have, um, has exposed me to different educational, research and health systems, and they've shaped both my personal and research journey. So I consider myself a global citizen. <laughs> so my overall research mission is to better understand adverse perinatal risk factors, including racial factors, and to predict short and long-term adverse outcomes after pregnancy complications in epidemiological methods. And my goal is to improve or contribute to improving maternal and child health and reducing health disparities. So why do we uh, study pregnancy in the first place? Well, we know that pregnancy is the time when most women come to the hospital. And so that means that the woman can be seen and examined by a healthcare provider and then um, can be followed up in time. And also there are many um, studies showing that pregnancy is a window to women's future health. Basically what they mean is that some pregnancy complications like preeclampsia and stillbed have been linked to long-term and short-term outcomes as well. And um, I mentioned reducing health disparities or inequality in the previous slide because some of those pregnancy complications and cardiovascular disease disproportionately affect Black women like myself and other minority and vulnerable groups. And so um, a lot of studies have started focusing on using the pregnancy period as a means to provide unique opportunities to monitor the health of women and to intervene as well. So I have lots of research interests, uh, which I like to broadly group into three main <laughs> themes, uh, with the pregnant wo woman as the denominator, and, and then with uh, vulnerable groups in maternal child health as the overarching theme. So the first theme is on risk prediction modeling, uh, where I've done work to predict adverse outcomes after pregnancy complications. And the second theme is on examining population risk factors, including racial factors in pregnancy complications and outcomes. And then the third theme is on perinatal pharmacoepi. So I published papers in, under the scenes, but uh, for this talk, I'll focus on the first two themes. So the first one on risk prediction modeling, um, just for the benefit of all, basically uh, clinical prediction models are tools that are used to predict future health and they usually have more than one variable. And a popular um, prediction model is or tool is the APGA score, which is used at delivery to predict neonatal survival. And the main reason for using um, such models is to identify people who are at high risk of having an outcome or a disease. And the goal is to improve prognosis through early prevention or treatment <laughs> and management. And the use of clinical prediction models also helps with shared clinical decision making because the, the clinician can tell the patient the, the, their risk of having an outcome. 
So one of the work I did um, under this thing was my PhD work, which was on the external validation, recalibration, and addition of placenta growth factor to the full PS model for women with preeclampsia. And this work was published in Pregnancy Hypertension. So some background on the full PS model. It was developed to predict severe maternal outcomes or severe maternal morbidity within 48 hours of admission for preeclampsia. And this model was developed to help guide clinical decisions such as when to administer antenatal corticosteroid or to transfer the woman to a higher level of antenatal care or to deliver the woman. And the data that was used for this model was collected from high income countries and tertiary um, pregnancy centers, including in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and in the UK. And the model included um, easily measured variables like gestational age, some signs and symptoms of preeclampsia like chest pain, and some standard laboratory tests like creatinine. So when this model was assessed, they had promising results. They had good discriminatory performance measured by the area under the rock. On it, um, that was 0.88, which means that 88% of the time, um, a woman who had preeclampsia, the model could differentiate between the woman that would go on to have a severe maternal outcome versus the one that would not go on to have an outcome amongst people admitted to preeclampsia. And you also had good calibration and risk um, stratification abilities, which are also measures for models. However, even when a model is developed and has good performance, before it can be implemented for use clinically, it's important to um, assess the external validity of the model, which simply means testing the model in a different data set other than the one it was developed in. And that is to ensure that the model results are transportable or generalizable. And so this is where I came in to the study um, for my PhD. And for this, we wrote a grant, um, which we uh, were awarded by the Canadian Institute of Health Research, CIHR. And it was for three years, and that was all funded my PhD, thankfully. <laughs> so um, for the data set, I uh, abstracted um, records from the women's charts um, from similar population, because when you're testing a model, you have to use similar population and cohort. So um, I actually had um, records from women who had preeclampsia, used the same eligibility criteria, and um, got data for, on the predictors and the outcomes. And I got data from Canada, you spent like six months in the UK collecting data as well. And I also got some data from Finland and the US. And then I applied the published um, model equation to calculate the predicted probability for, of outcome for each case. And I assessed the model based on discrimination, like I talk, talked about, which is measured by the area under the rock and uh, uh, measures the ability to distinguish between high and low risk groups. I also assess it based on calibration, which is the agreement between the predicted and observed outcomes, and then stratification and classification ability, which is the ability of the model to stratify or classify women to low and high risk groups. So in total, I had about 2,400 women. And when I applied the model, I found that the uh, discrimination or the area under the rock was still very high, 0 0.81, um, similar to the original model, which meant that the the model was externally valid, as well as the calibration and the other um, performance assessments were also very good, as you can see from this um, area under the rock. And then after that, I also tested the model in data collected from low and medium income countries, because we initially started with high income countries, and we saw good performance, even though slightly lower. So the area under the rock was 0 0.77. So in summary, uh, my work showed that the full peers model was externally valid for prediction of severe maternal outcomes among women admitted with preeclampsia. And uh, based on my on these findings, um, the, the model was then recommended by the UK NICE guidelines. NICE stands for National Institute for Health and Care Excellence. So it was recommended by the NICE guidelines for the management of preeclampsia and hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And so the impact that this study has had is that women who are most likely to develop such adverse outcomes can now be easily identified using the model and manage more timely and appropriately to prevent these outcomes. So after I did this work and I realized that we could predict short-term outcomes because that was outcomes within 48 hours, it made me think about whether we could also predict long-term outcomes in this group of high-risk um, pregnancy population. Um, so why long-term outcomes? 
for this population. Well, like um, preeclampsia, as I mentioned, and other hypertensive disorders of pregnancy are linked with increased risk of cardiovascular disease. And if we can identify these women at high risk, then that can help with early prevention. Um, we do already have some existing cardiovascular risk model like the Framihan, but then they were not developed using data of young um, women. So I, the mean age for of women in the cohort was about 50 years. And usually you should have, you should use a model that is developed in a similar population. And there wasn't any existing model. And so it led to my first work during my postdoc where I developed a model to predict 10 year risk of premature cardiovascular disease in women with a history of hypertensive disorders of pregnancy. And by premature, I meant um, cardiovascular disease happening before 60 years old. So this paper was published in the Journal of American Heart Association, JAHA. And for this uh, particular study, I wanted to see whether um, variables that are easily me measured in, in um, admin data sets can be used to predict um, outcomes. So I used the hospital discharge abstract database in Quebec in Canada. And this includes um, all deliveries that take place in the province from 1989 and up in Canada and in, in um, Quebec, about 98% of deliveries take place in the hospital. Also, um, because Canada has a more universal health care system, um, most of the women have access to um, health care or hospital admissions. And then um, this data also includes all the diagnostic codes and procedure codes um, abstracted from discharge summary. So for this study, I restricted my cohort to women who had at least one type of <coughs> hypertension in pregnancy. So either she had chronic hypertension or persistent hypertension, which is when the woman has high blood pressure before 20 weeks gestation. Or if the woman had gestational hypertension, which is after 20, um, high blood pressure after 20 weeks gestation, or if she had preeclampsia, which is um, high blood pressure after 20 weeks plus proteinuria or some form of organ dysfunction. Or if the woman had post preeclampsia, which is when the woman has chronic hypertension and then has proteinuria after 20 weeks. And the outcome for this was hospitalization for cardiovascular disease. So if the woman was hospitalized for conditions such as heart disease or cerebrovascular disease and within 10 years of delivery. So I identified both um, hypertension in pregnancy and um, cardiovascular disease using diagnostic and intervention codes. I excluded women who had pre-existing cardiovascular disease from this cohort or who had died in the first pregnancy because it could not be followed up. And then I followed women from the first pregnancy complicated by hypertension until 10 years after or to the end of the study period. And um, I developed the model using cross regression and um, selected mod the final variables using lasso technique, which kind of shrinks the, the estimate until it gets the final variables. And then I calculated the prediction, uh, predicted risk, and also did some internal validation. And I assessed the model based on the um, performance uh, criteria like discrimination and the rest. So I had uh, 95,000 women in this um, study who had um, hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, of which 1.6% of them had cardiovascular disease happening within 10 years of delivery. And looking uh, comparing the characteristics of, of these women, those who had cardiovascular outcome or disease were more likely to be older, to have um, be socioeconomically disadvantaged, <laughs> to use um, substance during pregnancy or to have pre-existing comorbidity like obesity and diabetes. The final model variables included um, maternal age and demographic and um, comorbidity as well as some pregnancy factors like um, number of complications and cesarean delivery. And what I found in the result was that the, the model performance was moderate. So the, the area under the rock was 0 0.66, um, and then the slope was 0 0.95. So my, my study or the study showed that easily available variables in admin data set can moderately, moderately predict cardiovascular disease amongst women who have hypertension in pregnancy, but there's definitely need to improve this model maybe by adding more discriminat discriminatory variables like blood pressure measurements and laboratory tests, which we didn't have in this data set. And then even after that, it, there's 
it is important to test the, the model externally or externally validate the model before it can be introduced into clinical practice. Yet, um, the model still has potential impact to improve cardiovascular prevention in women through targeted interventions if you can identify this high risk women. So, moving on to the next theme on examining population risk factors and racial, um, including racial. Um, disparities and in pregnancy complications like severe maternal morbidity and outcomes. So uh, background on severe maternal morbidity or SMM, it's a composite term for life-threatening conditions such as severe preeclampsia, acute renal failure, cardiac complications that happen to a woman and threatens her life around the time of pregnancy and delivery and up to 42 days thereafter. And there are studies that are suggesting that SMM is rising in Canada and in the US and, and some other countries, including uh, some other high income countries. Now, it's well known that SMM is closely associated with the woman dying around time of pregnancy and delivery and up to 42 days after. And it's also associated with a uh, woman being readmitted to the hospital within a year of delivery. But at the time when I conduct when I, I was doing this research, um, there weren't any studies examining SMM and long-term risk of mortality. And so that led to um, this study where I examined the relationship between SMM and long-term risk of death in women. Um, it was published in Obstetrics and Gynecology and won the 2021 um, Paper Prize Award and um, McGill Medsta Award. Um, I also used similar um, cohort or database, so the Quebec hospitalization for this um, study. And uh, SMM was defined according to the Can Canadian Perinatal Surveillance System, CPSS. So um, the CPSS has their own list and codes of 42 um, indicators for SMM. So it's slightly different from the ACOG criteria that is used in, in the US. And then the un unexposed group were those who did not have SMM at the same pregnancy, and I identified SMM using ICD and procedure codes. So the primary outcome was hospital death at any time after delivery, and the secondary outcome was long-term death uh, or death after for two days of delivery because this was the new piece that wasn't really known about. And um, long-term mortality was further grouped uh, uh, in different time points. So we grouped it between 43 days and less than one year after delivery, um, one year to less than five years, five years to less than 10, and then 10 years thereafter. So um, women were followed from their delivery till death or the end of study period, which was um, 2018, uh, which meant that we had up to 29 years of follow up for some of these women. And then I use cock regression models to estimate the hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals for the association between SMM and mortality. And I adjusted for uh, confounders like age, parity, and the delivery time period. So um, this study, I had about 1.2 million women um, included. And comparing uh, characteristics, um, we saw that women who had SMM were more likely to be older, so 35 years and above. Uh, we're also more likely to be um, nulliparous and have um, twins or, or triplets, and also more likely to have pre existing comorbidity or be socioeconomically deprived. Looking at the um, association between SMM and mortality at any time after delivery, we saw that women who had um, any SMM had twice the rate of dying compared to women who did not have any SMM, which is the reference group. And we saw an increased um, rate of dying for all subtypes of SMM here, um, but most especially if the woman had cardiac complication or cerebrovascular accident or acute renal failure, or she needed um, and had required assisted ventilation, um, then her risk of dying was 10 times or more higher than women who did not have any SMM. So looking at the secondary outcome, which was death after 42 days of delivery, we still saw increased risk. Um, so women who had any SMM had 1.5 times increased risk of dying compared with those without any SMM. And again, um, we saw increased risk for all types of SMM, but still um, kind of complications and the other subtypes that I mentioned still compared the greatest risk of dying after 42 days. 
And even looking across all the different time periods that we had um, examined, we saw a continuous um, increased risk of, of um, mortality amongst women who had SMM and amongst the different types of SMM, although the risk declined over time. We also looked at um, SMM and risk of, of causes of mortality. So besides obstetric cause of death, which is usually death within one year, we saw that SMM was closely associated with cardiovascular deaths or um, pulmonary related deaths or neuro neurologic related deaths. So um, in summary, SMM is associated with increased risk of dying um, and remains um, consistent throughout follow-up and severe cardiac complications, acute renal failure and cerebrovascular accidents where leading morbidities are associated with mortality after 42 days. And so a study indicates the need for closer follow-up um, clinically even beyond the postpartum period. And um, the impact is that it, um, we can identify some of those men who have increased risk of dying and then follow up with them and intervene. So um, I did conduct another study examining the long-term risk of cardiovascular disease after SMM. Uh, the study was published in um, Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes. And the reason for this was after we saw the increased risk of cardiovascular related death, we wanted to find out more the types of cardiovascular disease and what the risk were for women with SMM. Also, we know that cardiovascular disease has a huge burden on, on women, it's one of the leading causes of death, and more women than men die from um, cardiovascular disease. So if a woman has had attack, one, about one in four women who have had attack will die within the first year of their heart attack versus one in five men. And so uh, the rationale for the study also was that since we had seen that other pregnancy complications had uh, showed increased risk of cardiovascular disease, and we had seen that SMO was associated with increased risk of, of cardiovascular related death, um, yet we hadn't seen studies really examining the risk of cardiovascular disease, except for one study that was um, conducted in Medicaid Pennsylvania claims data, but they only followed up for up to about two years. So we said conduct the study. Again, I use the Quebec um, cohort and I define SMM according to CPS as um, definition and I excluded women with history of cardiovascular disease or who died at first delivery for this um, 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 topic. And then the outcome was hospitalization for cardiovascular disease. Um, after 42 days of delivery, which I identified using diagnostic codes and, and intervention codes. And uh, cardiovascular disease included um, conditions like heart failure um, and other cardiovascular um, interventions and admission. And uh, for this study, I followed women from 42 days to when they had the outcome or to the end of the, the study. And I used time varying Cox regression analysis to estimate the hazard ratios and 95% confidence intervals for the association between SMM and um, risk of cardiovascular disease. And I also adjusted for some compa compounders. So I had uh, about 1.3 women, uh, 1.3 million women in, in the study. And um, comparing the incidence per 10,000 passing years for cardiovascular disease, we saw increased um, um, incidence for those who had SMM versus those without SMM, as well as women who were 35 years and above and who had comorbidity or used substance during pregnancy or were socioeconomically deprived. So consistent findings across different studies. Um, looking at the risk of cardiovascular disease after SMM, we saw a 1.78 time um, increased rate of uh, having cardiovascular disease for women who had any SMM compared to those who did not have any SMM. And we saw that this risk was increased for all types of um, um, SMM, and especially if the woman had cardiac complications, uh, cerebrovascular accident, accident ventilation, or if she was admitted to ICU. They also looked at the relationship between, or the association between SMM and specific types of cardiovascular disease outcomes. And we saw that um, for all the types of cardiovascular outcomes that we um, examined, and if a woman had any SMM, then her risk of having any of those cardiovascular outcomes 
were increased, but especially if she, um, especially her outcome, were more likely to be um, heart failure. So she had a higher risk of having heart failure, two times more likely than women who did not have any SMM, as well as having had cardiomyopathy and other pulmonary vascular disease. So in summary, uh, from this study, we found that SMM was associated with increased rate of cardiovascular disease after delivery. And again, um, the types of SMM that were more, that had the highest risk were cardiac complications, acute renal failure, or cerebrovascular accidents. And this still reinforces the message that, that, that we need to continue to follow up with women after they, they deliver, especially if they have um, SMM. So um, having done the studies, um, you know, the more you read, the more you learn stuff and the more you want to do. So um, I was seeing a lot of studies on racial disparities in, in SMM, but I hadn't seen any um, evidence synthesis or systematic review looking at uh, the association or, or what the risk was between black and white women for the disparity in SMM. So I conducted a systematic review um, to synthesize evidence on black white disparities in the prevalence of severe cardiovascular maternal morbidity. And the study was published in American Heart Journal. And I um, searched um, um, engines like Medline and M-based uh, up to July, 2021 and compared black versus white women. And the outcome was severe cardiovascular maternal morbidity, such as acute myocardial infarction and stroke during pregnancy. And then I extracted relevant information, including the unadjusted and adjusted uh, effect estimates reported by the study, and then pulled the um, analysis. So in total, we had um, 18 studies, all of which were conducted in the US. And um, from the studies, about 7.6 million were black um, women and 26 million white women. And what we found was that compared to with white women, black women had increased risk, about two times increased risk of um, having a severe cardiovascular maternal morbidity, even after adjusting for uh, uh, confounders and pre-existing morbidity. And so um, we think that the study highlights the need for public health interventions to address racial disparities in maternal morbidity. And also, uh, we think that there's need for more studies outside the U.S. Um, to analyze um, what the racial disparities are, because like I said, all the studies were from the U.S., as well as to examine what other factors related to race might be causing this, because we know that race <coughs> is a social construct. So based on this, uh, what are my current and future research directions? Well, I'm still working on the, these themes um, in health partners and still on um, previous work and grants that I've, been, I've established and I'm still establishing. So for example, um, I got a grant to examine health of mothers after SMM in Canada. Um, and so the overall goal of the grant was to assess the burden of SMM on women's health. And some of the aims were to estimate and examine the risk of subsequent obstetric outcomes after SMM, and also the um, risk of non-obstetric outcomes and also um, risk of hospitalization. So I just finished this study on obstetric outcomes in Canada. And um, um, I was contacted by CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting um, Corporation TV for an interview. This paper was published in AJOC um, just a few months ago, and I had this interview just last week. So I decided I would just play it for you guys to hear the summary. <laughs> yeah. Coming up, health risks still exist when delivering a baby. Researchers at the McGill University Health Center found that those who experience severe complications in their first delivery are three times more likely to face complications when giving birth a second time. That's when we come back. What's the next chapter in driving pipeline? It's time to turn the page on engagement. <laughs> For nearly a century, Shure has set the standard for audio excellence. 
And what we've done on stages and in studios works for the workplace, too. From startups to global enterprises, we've got solutions that bring more simplicity, clarity, and coverage to conferencing. So teams find their group and business hits the high notes. Jergens Essential Oil Body Butter Collection. The feel good feeling of Jergens. Well, there are still health risks when delivering a baby, even in 2023 in Canada. Researchers at the McGill University Health Center found that those who experience severe complications in their first delivery are three times more likely to face complications when giving birth a second time. The study has been published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. It looked at nearly a million pregnancies dating back 32 years in Quebec. Ugochi Vivienne Uka is the lead author and a postdoc fellow at McGill University in perinatal epidemiology. Welcome to our Montreal. Thank you for having me. What did you want to find out with this study? <laughs> So we conducted the study because before now we didn't know what the risk of recurrence for serious pregnancy complications were. Um, there had been a few studies, mostly in the US, that had looked at some uh, pregnancy complications in smaller samples, and they had only examined um, the pregnancy complications as composite exposure and outcome, but we wanted to look deeper into the different types of pregnancy complications and see what um, those women's risks are for having a recurrence and also to help guide clinicians on how to better manage these women. So what qualifies as severe complications? So um, in this study, we, it's termed severe maternal morbidity, and it's, it's just a composite term for um, conditions that are unexpected and threatens the life of a mother. And this usually happens around the time of labor or delivery or a few weeks before or after. And some examples are severe hemorrhage or bleeding and also severe preeclampsia, which is usually characterized by high blood pressure and um, some organ dysfunctions. We also have sepsis and cardiac complications. So those conditions that threaten the life of a mother, and also they have some serious um, short and long-term adverse um, health effects on the woman's well-being and health. So they're a huge public health priority. So the complications then, uh, you know, as you're alluding to, lead to long-term complications for the mother. I mean, are those also severe complications for the mother in the future, or are those kind of manageable but lifelong complications? So um, we have um, some other studies that show that some of these men who have this ser serious pregnancy complications also have long-term risk of cardiovascular disease. Um, but we didn't know much about um, what their short-term risk were or the risk of recurrence in the next pregnancy. And so that was what we were more interested in in the study. Okay. And how did you go about studying this? So we use the large um, provincial database. So we use the database um, from Quebec and we analyzed over 800,000 women who had at least two deliveries um, in the hospital in Quebec. Now we know in Canada, um, most women deliver in the hospital. So that means we're able to capture a, a lot of those women. And the cohort started from 1989 and um, we ran some regression analysis to examine the risk of this outcomes. Well, so you looked at, you know, more than 30 years worth of data. Are the risks the same for labor and delivery 30 years ago compared to giving birth today? Um, so we did not particularly examine um, that in our study because we kind of adjusted or accounted for the time period of delivery in the regression analysis. So um, even if the risks are different over time, that would not have affected the estimates that we found in our study. That's a good question, and I think um, some studies look at trend over time. Well, and that's something that a lot of women have experienced with, especially if they've had a big gap between between pregnancies. That sometimes you find the follow up is just so much more for the for the you know pregnancy now in terms of technology, in terms of testing and and vigilance. Really, when it comes to certain conditions, that you would 
assume that it, there would be fewer complications and a better outcome. So that I, that's probably definitely, well, I've, you know, formed the next study for you. Go Chiefs, there you go. <laughs> yes, um, so the Canadian pioneer surveillance system um, definitely tracks the trends. And as you mentioned, even though you would expect that the complications would have reduced over time, that's mm -hmm. not exactly what is happening, even though we didn't study that in this study, but, but that's not what is being found Instead, it appears that this um, pregnancy complications might be rising, and some of the reasons might be due to advanced maternal age. We know that women are giving birth now at an older age than before. We also know that there's um, rising rates of um, comorbidity like obesity and also um, the use of assisted reproductive therapy. So some of those things are contributing to increasing rates of serious pregnancy complications. And, you know, you looked also at second pregnancy as well and sort of the complications. So if you've had in, in the study, if a woman has had severe complications with the first pregnancy, what's the likelihood of them having it with the second or it being more severe? So if a woman had severe um, um, pregnancy complication in her first pregnancy, then um, about 6% of them had another um, complication in the second pregnancy compared with 2%. Um, for women that didn't have any uh, serious pregnancy complications in their first pregnancy. And compared, comparing the two groups, so those who had serious complications versus those who did not in the first pregnancy, those women with serious pregnancy complications in their first pregnancy had three times higher risk of um, recurrence, yes, compared with those that did not have um, um, any serious pregnancy complications. And we also found in our study that the types of complications um, the consequences de depended on the types of complications. For example, if a woman had severe preeclampsia in the first pregnancy, then her risk was four times higher. Um, whereas if she had um, cardiac or heart-related complication, then she even had seven-fold higher risk of having a recurrence in um, subsequent pregnancy compared with those who did not have such complications. So now that we have this information, what will doctors and patients be able to do with it? Uh, that's a good question. I, uh, I believe many women who have um, these complications would like to have children but are afraid or don't know what their risks are for the next pregnancy. And so the estimates that we provided can help doctors counsel women about their subsequent risk. Also, a lot of these pregnancy complications can be prevented by early identification of high-risk patients and treatment. For example, a doctor can um, plan to induce delivery for high-risk um, patients rather than um, wait and then it leads to uh, unplanned or emergency cesarean section. Also, um, if you identify high-risk patients early enough, then they can be transferred to higher subspecialty of antenatal care. There's also pos potential possibility for treatment for some of these women. Um, there's been studies that show that low-dose aspirin can help in the prevention of severe preeclampsia. So if we can identify women at high risk of severe preeclampsia, then we can treat them earlier. And, and so we're hoping that all this information from this study can help to guide the management and better prepare the healthcare system so as to prevent the recurrence of these complications that can kill the mother. Well, you know, women know that there are problems with the medical system in dealing with their with any illness, whether you are pregnant or not. Uh, a lot of it surrounding the reproductive system. How do you think medical practitioners need to change the way they follow up with patients, even after they give birth? I mean, I have anecdotally, you know, people who've told me that they had severe complications during pregnancy. And then after they gave birth, there was just no follow up. Nobody, nobody even spoke to them about something that could happen in the future. I mean, th clearly, that is something that needs to be rectified. There should be more follow up after birth. Yes, absolutely. And you just nailed the point because um, the key is following up with women after birth, um, even before discharge, first of all, to make sure that those women, their blood pressures are well controlled and they're in good shape and form to be discharged. And to stress to them, um, if um, you can identify those at high risk, to stress to them that they need to come back to the clinic. And also there has to be a, um, some sort of placement in the system where we, we can easily um, keep following up with this woman by calling them and checking up on them. Um, I know that in some other places, they have some home um, postnatal care where nurses go and visit um, mm -hmm. um, the women who escape it. I think things like that, um, where you have midwives and other kinds of healthcare providers might help 
to um, improve the health of women. Well, let's see what happens coming out of this study. Ugochi, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Ugochi Vivian Uka is the lead author of this study and a former postdoc fellow at McGill University in perinatal epidemiology. The study was published in the American Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology. <laughs> that was it. Yeah. Thank you for listening. So if you have questions. <laughs>